um well, okay. thanks for being here with you. yeah and we'll well i'll grab doors and we can we can take it off yeah okay so it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, michael makowski so he's associate professor at um the department of economics in clemson university his research focus in law enforcement crime religion and the love of club goods uh Today's paper is about uh, club goods. Um, so he has published in well, super top journals, in com including uh, AR, Review Economic Studies, um, Journal of Law and Economics. And then, so it's such a pleasure to have you here. Uh, today, um, Mike is going to be uh, talking about monopsony and local club goods. Um, so thank you, Mike. Uh, thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, I guess I'm just going to sit for most of it and just sort of click through. I'll probably jump up a few times, but because this is the emphasis really is the Q&A, uh, I'm going to spend a little more time just kind of laying the foundation in the background so we have a sense of the question we're trying to answer and, and what the data is and what we're creating. And uh, and then we'll have a chance to kind of go through the results probably as much as anything during the Q&A when we, we talk about whatever it is you guys want to talk about. Um, I My true joy is when I get to do something that you can interpret as pure economics. But if you just scratch it just a little bit, you realize below the surface, there's a lot of interdisciplinary stuff going on. And so that's why I'm I'm very excited to hear about all the different backgrounds of the people in the room, uh, because if you want to take the uh, the discussion in a per perpendicular direction, I'm actually quite comfortable with that. I might not understand all the jargon you're using, but that's fine. So also, we have obviously a lot of economists in the room. We're going to talk about some of the stuff at a very basic level, because I've been presenting this in, in environments where, you know, standard econ jargon isn't always just assumed knowledge. All right. So, for example, most uh, most people in the room know what monopsony is. But for just a quick refresher, it's uh, this parallel version of monopoly. But instead of there being one seller of a product, there's one employer of labor. All right. And so. What this means is that they're facing an upward sloping supply curve of labor, which means they have some choice in terms of what they pay and how many people will be employed. Uh, it leads to firms hiring fewer people and paying wages below, oh, my first typo, below productivity, below, below the marginal uh, product of labor. That's me taking out a term from econ and then replacing it with a typo. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Great start. Um, so... Where monopsony power comes from is always and everywhere limits on outside options, on employee options. And the two big constraints are always going to be who else can you work for locally and what other local areas could you exit to, right? So you have these two dimensions and the classic story of monopsony that still haunts all of our sort of heuristic models is the company town, right? You're stuck there, your family can't move without getting in a covered wagon and risking death. Uh, but there's only one employer. There's the mining company in West Virginia or somewhere else in Appalachia, and they have so much market power when they decide who to hire and how much to pay them. Now, this is carried over where when most economists think about monopsony power, they think about labor market concentration, how many employers there are. But there's been a lot of research in the last 10 years that market concentration, while still important, isn't a sufficient explanation anymore for where monopsony power is coming from. And there's lots of there's theories that get floated out. But when you really push the data, there's a whole lot of hands going up going, I, I don't know. So what we're going to do here is. We're going to say, all right, labor market monopsony power, labor supply elasticities, they depend on these outside worker options. And what we're going to conjecture is that distant labor markets are less appealing to workers who enjoy geographically specific benefits, which means if we talk about these two sources of monopsony power and one is workers leaving to a different market, that the constraint is themselves that they don't want to move because of what uh, benefits they enjoy and connections they have to the local area. I, although, so what we're going to hypothesize is that compensating wage differentials, these benefits to being somewhere, 
these can actually be captured by a local employer as rents on labor that they can say, oh, because you get such a benefit from being here, I can pay you less. Mm -hmm. And so when people are looking at generic evidence of monopsony power, when they're looking for lower wages, born of this power, part of what they're observing is, is more of the wage being paid as this local amenity, this benefit of you get the privilege of working here. Mm -hmm. And so then that doesn't, that shows up as lower wages because they can't see the benefit to working in that local area in the data. All right. So why can firms capture these? Because they're outside the firm, right? If they're really hard to replicate, you can't just, a lot of local amenities, you can't just willfully place into the universe like another market good, right? They're just really hard to produce and they tie workers to the local area. And when you think about all the social things that can connect us to an, a local area, well, some of them are so universal, that's just baked into the cake. So family ties, very nearly all of us have some form of family ties remaining. And a great uh, majority of, more, great majority of us have those locally, right? Academics, we're nomads, we're the weirdos. Just keep that in mind. If you, don't use yourself as the mental model for labor in this setting. Uh, religious and secular clubs, which is what we're gonna focus on, those are a choice. And you're, you're literally choosing those over other options such as migration. And one of the things we're gonna note is that religious and secular goods are a form of insurance. They provide what's called social insurance. Well, you know, migration in a weird way is, a, is an insurance policy too. It says like, oh, if things go bad here, I can just go somewhere else. So in a way you're trading one kind of insurance for another, one that ties you. Uh, and so club goods, this is just well-established in, in a, a very large literature. Club goods are an incredibly important source of social insurance. Um, so yeah, we're going to look at what happens when members of a labor pool trade one kinds of insurance for another. Uh, if we want to test this, we got to find a club good that's really important, that's heterogeneous, Right. That, so it has to be salient to their decisions, but also there has to be enough variation that we can actually observe its effect. Uh, and it needs to be geographically specific. It can't just follow you everywhere. It can't be available everywhere. And it has to be in a setting. This is just the practical side of it. It has to be in a setting where we have rich enough firm level data that we can measure its impact relative to your productivity. So we can look at your productivity your wages, and your local ties. We need to be able to see all three. So otherwise, otherwise it's just us talking. Welcome to Indonesia. Why Indonesia? Because it checks all these boxes. And because- Good timing for today too, with the White House summit. It is. <laughs> it's all worked out nice. Um, <laughs> the, um, now, the claim has been made that Indonesia is the most religious country in the world. Mm -hmm. that's convenient for our paper but we are not going to get into an argument over which is the most versus second most religious country what i do hope i can convince you of is that indonesia is an exceptionally religious country and that religion is very important there and that it is the dominant club good mm -hmm. uh now non-muslims are also a significant part of the population, even though it's 87% Muslim, you know, there's still millions of non-Muslims, but they're spread across the archipelago and they're spread unevenly. They clump, right? For lots of obvious reasons, they want to be near each other. So you have Protestants spread a lot of uh, across a lot of pro uh, provinces. Think of provinces as states and Kabupatens as large counties. All right. So you have this clumping. Protestants are in some places, not others. Catholics are actually uh, the majority in one province, but they're also still spread across a lot of the other Kabupatens. Um, Hindus are incredibly concentrated in Bali, but there are still other places where they have significant pockets. Um, and there's pockets of Confucians, Sikhs, Baha'i, um, 
indigenous religions, I'm going to pre-apologize because there's no other way to do this. <laughs> We're going to essentially categorize in our analysis Muslims, Protestants, Catholics, <laughs> Buddhists, <laughs> Hindus, and then from the data point of view, everyone else turns into other. Now, that doesn't mean that we think all of the religions that are in the other group actually have affinity for one another, but rather that where you have a large pocket of these other, they will be of one or two dominant subface within that. And it's just the only way, given our data, that we can observe them. We, the reason we have data is because of how salient religion is to Indonesian daily life. Okay, It is on your driver's license. What of these uh, recognized religions you have chosen to be affiliated with? This is this is an incredibly salient part of your identity. Um, so I want you to, I want you to think of the shading here as getting a sense of where non-Muslims are, and it's pretty spread out. Um, you obviously have some places it's more dominant than others, where there's urban areas, uh, you get a larger share. Um, but you also get pockets uh, of very tightly knit communities of minority religions on the absolute tiniest of islands. This is, what I tried to color code here is the majority faith by Kabu Patan, all right? And so you can see these really strong pockets of Catholics and Protestants. Uh, if you're looking very closely, you can see Bali. Um, I just want to kind of give you a sense of the spread, but at the same time, the ability to concentrate, that they do find each other. And, uh, you know, I think, I don't know if this is going to work on here. No, it's not. You guys want you to trust me that the histogram is bimodal and you basically within at the Kabu Padan level, what you get is all Muslim or lots of everyone else. That's the two dominant modes. It's a faith based histogram <laughs> in that your faith in me. Um, <laughs> all right. So the new monopsony literature is obsessed with upward sloping labor supply curves and we see them. We see them everywhere. Uh, this is mostly U.S. data, but not all. Um, and it's used. Uh, Sorry, can I just interrupt just for yeah. one second? It looks like the slides are not being shared for the folks online, so they can actually see them. Oh, so, speaking uh, of faith-based. Yeah, yeah, you talk about faith-based, right? So you, should we just pause for a second? If you wouldn't mind, just for not at all. seconds, and we'll just get that shared so that everybody can see. Maybe even in the link. So work right now. Yeah. Oh, I get. I can just keep chit chatting. I can vamp for a little bit while he's just vamping. Uh, hey, yeah. So what's the deal with? I, no. <laughs> the thing I want you to appreciate is that monopsony is being consistently used as an explanation for other phenomena, like say gender and racial wage gaps. Right. That monopsony power is an important input to how these phenomena can persist. And, but. When you're using something as the underpinning for a different empirical phenomenon, it becomes a little dangerous if we don't know where that phenomenon itself is coming from, right? So we caution needs to be warranted when wielding monopsony power as your explanatory cudgel. Because we're still not 100% confident we know where modern monopsony power is coming from. And what we're trying to put out in this paper is the first wave of evidence that that social goods, that the social costs of migration, the social costs of exit, are what is driving a lot of monopsony power or observations of monopsony power in the modern world. So. You're doing a great job, man. Oh, you know, you know, you know, you know how to make this full screen nice and easy? Or? Um, was F or five, F eleven, F eight? It's a PDF, so I, I'm not sure. Okay, to try. No. Nope. Maximize the window. Or yeah, yeah, that's all you do. That's uh, better. We can scroll. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure there's some really 
Simple. I don't know why oh, we're in that. That. Rome yeah. when we're want when we're viewing the slide deck. Yeah, separate. That's part of what's happening here is we're separate. not in Kenobi. Let me. Sorry. That's okay. I want another. Is it? It's not academia until there's an issue. Well, uh, <laughs> usually this comes up in the cybersecurity discussion. Mm -hmm. Um, why can't I find a PDF? Because well, it's currently as uh, it's currently being opened in Chrome. And do you have Adobe well, on this computer? Let's just download. Yeah, it. that seems like the move. That's it, and we'll just save it, <laughs> and we'll be off to the races. Hopefully, we can just let the questions start to percolate. That's right. Okay. <laughs> okay. This is a step in the right direction, perhaps. <laughs> I'm probably not going to let you. Please sign us. <laughs> Explorer. Uh, you just oh, you just uh, did a. Uh, um, no. Yeah. Is it? It's here. No. I think that's it. Yeah, you want that one? That's yeah. it. Maybe. And then you want to go full screen in that. You want to go full screen. So, so there's. There should be a. You're still online. Though. There, 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 there it is. There you go. Do it. <laughs> 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 Take it, that. It's all happening. That. Good. Was yeah, yeah that's the PA. Yeah, just go back one. There we are. This is it? Yeah, let's do it. All right. That only took 20 minutes. All right. Though. Sorry about that. <laughs> Science, everybody. Science. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> I just noticed that. <laughs> so nicely done. Thanks, Doc. <laughs> I'm getting uh, mocked online. Macaluso Herbshine. <laughs> Last year, AER. Look, monopsony power is going up and labor market concentration in the US is flat. And this blew a lot of people's minds. Well, because if it's not coming from labor market share, where's it coming from? And what we think we have is an answer. But we're not going to go to the US data to test it yet, because we're going to go somewhere where, by the way, if you want to try to pick the dominant club good in the US, I wish you all the best. Hmm. But um, I'm pretty confident I can say, we can say what the dominant club good is in Indonesia. And that's a big part of why we're starting out there. Um, and there's a lot, you know, I, yeah, I'm not giving the literature enough credit because this is a quick talk. Um, other sources of monopsony power. One of the things I will throw out there, well, by the way, these are all very valid, especially in the US market, which is very complicated. Uh, my favorite is uh, Tyler Ransom has this just absolutely lovely structural paper where he estimates the net present value, the net present uh, essentially um, reservation wage of moving in the US for a household where the dominant earner uh, doesn't have any college education. So you basically have to write people a check for the uh, equivalent of $438,000 to get them to move. Now, is that too high? Maybe, it's good. is it too low? The point here is this is essentially a remainder in an equation, which says, here's everything that's left over once we use the basics of labor economics to explain whether or not you're gonna move. And he refers to these as essentially non-market amenities, all the other stuff, right? It's worth a lot to people and that's why they're not moving. Whatever it is they're getting locally, it's why they're not moving. So this gives us our testable prediction. So labor markets are characterized by workers affiliated with geographically specific religious and secular goods, right? They're affiliated with these local club goods. Where you get a lot more of them, you're gonna get bigger markdowns on wages. That's a hypothesis that we're gonna test. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna actually go after us with three different measures of club goods. We're gonna do just minority religious affiliation, right? It's hard to find each other. If you do find each other, you don't wanna move. Uh, religious school enrollment. Neat thing here, uh, Chen 2010 JPE showed that when the Asian financial crisis hit Indonesia and it brought with it 78% inflation overnight, that a lot of households responded, Muslim households, by enrolling their kids in madrasas. Because if your kid was enrolled in a religious school, you had essentially priority claim on social insurance and other club goods. Right. They needed it to survive. And we're going to use that. Uh, and then because, again, I like a certain kind of diversity, I do like to remind people that club goods are not exclusively religious. 
And so what we identify is a really popular secular club good in Indonesia called the Arizon, which is essentially a savings club. And one of the things we're going to show is that in areas that are really tightly knit through these savings clubs, people don't want to move as much and firms are able to mark down wages more. So here's our big result. Monopsony rents, which were just wage markdowns, are going to be larger where religious minorities are more concentrated. And this has really strong complementarity with labor market concentration. The two are working in concert. It's not one or the other, it's both. And when you get both, that's when you get really big markdowns. That's when you get real measurable monopsony power. And then we're going to use a couple of event studies using that Asian financial crisis, which is it's 97 slash 98. Starts in July of 97. Um, that you have, you don't really observe any sort of markdown increase, any monopsony power increase with Madrasa enrollment until the financial crisis. And once that hits, and all of a sudden Muslim families are desperate to have access to these social goods, places where a lot of people are enrolled, have a lot of their children enrolled, that's where you see the monopsony power effect. Right. So it kick, it only kicks on after the crisis. And because contrast is wonderful, Arizons, on the other hand, are cash-based savings clubs. What happens to a cash-based savings club when there's 78% inflation overnight? They don't matter anymore. And what do we see? We see larger markdowns. We see markdowns increasing with Arizon participation until the inflation crisis. And then it turns off. And it just goes away. All right. Um, I, I don't know where we are now, given. So I'm going to do. Do you need to take another 20 minutes after all that? No, we still have some time. We yeah. still have at least. All right. So what I'm going to do is this. I'm just going to blast through the data and then just make sure we all understand for the conversation later what the, the metric is. Right. The key metric. So we're getting really wonderful administrative level data from Indonesia from the manufacturing survey. Um, we also have a longitudinal household survey that's going to let us track things like madrasa enrollment for household children and uh, Arizon participation. And then we're going to use the national census for religion. Again, because religion is, is on your government ID, it's also included in the census. So we know at the uh, fidelity level of a national census uh, what the minority religious population is in each Kabupaten. We're going to combine all that data together. Uh, the fancy economic thing we're going to do is we're going to structurally estimate firm level wage markdowns. So for every firm, we're going to tease out, let me rephrase this, for every manufacturing firm, we're going to tease out what the actual marginal product of labor is for your manufacturing level employees, so your non-managers, your, your assembly line people, for lack of a better term. We're going to actually figure out how much your labor's worth. And we're going to know how much you're getting paid. And that means we can measure the gap. We can measure how much the firm is making or, you know, unit of labor and then how much they're paying them. And then that gap, that's going to be our metric for monopsony power. When that gets bigger, that's our evidence that there's greater monopsony power. Or, well, anyway, we'll get to that in a second. Um, and then we have, we're going to, we're going to create this panel, this Kabupaten year panel of wage markdowns. And we're going to see how much that varies with our club good measures. And we're also going to use the longitudinal household data to uh, see if our underlying hypothesis of these things are constraints on migration actually holds true. All right, we don't care about summary data. We don't care about summary data. We don't have time. Uh, we're using a really standard. We are trying to use the most boring, non-controversial method for estimating wage markdowns, you kind of just have to take that in faith. Uh, unless you're an IO person, then you obviously agree with me. Um, so we're gonna use Ackerberg Caves and Fraser 2015 uh, for estimating output elasticities. Uh, and we're gonna, we, we test two alternative models that generate essentially the same results, but that yay AER paper, that's the model we're just doing. Because if you're the top paper on the subject and you came out in the AER nine months ago, that's probably the move. Um, oh, and we're going to normalize this by product market power, which is how much monopoly power you have, because that's important. It doesn't change our results, but it's important. 
All right. First thing first, we've got to do a sanity check on the data. And yes, when firms have uh, represent a larger share of the local labor market, that wage markdown, that gap gets bigger. And that's exactly what you'd expect, right? If they have more power, if, if they represent, you know, 10, 15% of the entire local labor market, which means they represent a really big share of the local manufacturing labor market, then they don't have to pay as much relative to how much uh, you're making for them. And this is just different fixed effects, different uh, estimation me methodologies. I can make the effect bigger or smaller. Um, column six is what we're gonna use because that's the most precise and that's why we're getting the bigger magnitudes. Um, distribution of markdowns. Uh, in the paper, it's easier to do this, but if you put them both side by side, it's too small. There's no like explicit visible overlap with the non-Muslim map. The, the wage markdown and non-Muslim map, yeah, you can squint and see it a little bit, but it's not like you can just see it right away. Um, okay, I'm, I'm not gonna, if we wanna talk about the estimation methodology, we can later, but I don't think it's really that important for our context. Migration, uh, for non-Muslims, when there's a, this is a relative measure. So this is the quantile. It's not the number of, if you're Buddhists, other Buddhists, if you're Hindus, number of other Hindus. It's if you are in the 90th percentile, right? Uh, if, if where you are, where is it in the distribution of Kabupatans for your religion, right? Are you in, if you're in the 90th percentile of Hindus and you're Hindu, you don't want to move. Right. If you're in the 10th percentile, you really want to move. And that might be uh, a smaller number than, say, for Buddhists. But it's about the relative opportunity of moving. Can you improve your situation in terms of the size of your community by moving? When you're in a really high quantile for your religion, you don't want to move. And they don't. All right. Um, so every time you move up a quantile, you're 5 percent less likely to move. Um, and so all we wanted to show here is that you don't get a ton of variation across years. Because remember, this is um, cohorts of the, the survey, so it's every five years. But it is worth noting that this effect gets stronger for non-Muslims during the, the cohort of the, that has that crisis, right? Muslims, on the other hand, I mean, it matters a little but not very much. And even then, you know, once you add these all up, these effectively turn into zeros because Muslims, you're never really worried about finding other Muslims. There's, there's no shortage of places you can move to find a Muslim community in Indonesia. Again, you're 87% of the population. This is the predicted firm wage markdown. Did I skip? It did. I knew it. I saw the fuzzy thing there. The wage markdown is getting bigger when you have more non-Muslims. And when you interact that with labor market share, you're getting uh, a positive effect, but it's noisy. You don't really see it with the linear interaction that much. It's pretty noisy. Um, where you do see it really precisely is when you do that as a cubic model, because what matters is not having a few more non-Muslims. What matters is having a lot more. And so I'm not gonna make you look at an interaction table with a cubic. Instead, I'm just gonna graph the effects for you. This is the labor market share, uh, the labor share of the firm. So how much, how much of the local labor market they control, they employ, uh, just doing it by quintile, right? So your firm doesn't have a very large share. Your firm has a very large share. This is the predicted wage markdown on the y-axis. All right. And you'll notice that it's always increasing. Whenever you have a larger share of the labor market, you always get this positive effect, more labor market share, bigger markdown. But in the upper quartile of non-Muslims, the firms that have increasing labor market share in places that have a large minority religious population, it skyrockets up. This, they can't really leverage 
their share of the local labor market until they have a population that doesn't want to move. And then that's where they're capturing rents. That's where they're capturing these benefits as rents through lower wages. That's where they're marking it down. This is, in my opinion, the most important graph of the whole paper. Everything else is just about ways of more precisely testing this model. Because again, these are, we don't have these huge exogenous changes in local religious populations. We lack that power. Um, I, should we go to questions? Yeah. So and so half an hour at least. Yeah. And the only thing I wanted to note was in the inflation phenomenon is big. Just remember 70 to 78 percent. And when we do stuff like this is the Madrasa thing, it really doesn't matter until the crisis. And when we do the Arizona model, it really doesn't matter after the crisis. That's it. And then we have a bunch of other stuff we can just talk about. Good. So my first shot. Sorry right, again for the. Oh, it's fine. It happens. That's yeah. It's academic life. So you check the ones on Zoom, and then I mostly the comments so far have been like start with TF. What's going on with the? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> can't help with that. <laughs> yeah, any students first? Um, anybody? Putting on the spot, right? Okay. <laughs> Well, if not, then I think it's open. For me. Okay. Do we have somebody online? Not yet. Brian, Brian. no doubt. Brian? I know we will. I know he'll be jumping in soon. <laughs> okay, so I kind of start yeah, with a question. Maybe start, and, and then we'll turn to Brian. <laughs> Brian, no, Brian, go, go, go. Please go. Look, go. Let, let, let Brian okay, go. okay. Yeah. Brian, you're up. Oh, okay. I mean, I was more trying to hold back and give other people a chance to talk. Um, two things. Um, one is maybe just semantic, but um, also conceptually, you're using this term markdown. And when I hear that, it's as if I get the sense the firm with more power is squeezing the people. In terms of the actual mechanisms and how people, how companies set the wages they're paid, do you have much to indicate whether this is actually, you know, kind of something equivalent to that kind of thinking of we can, you know, pressure these people harder as opposed to the other part of the distribution having to, to compete more or shift their, be readier to shift their wages more and those with this market power shift less? Um, okay, I think I'll just stick with the one question for now. No, no, that's that's a really valuable question. And it's something that this paper framing does matter. Uh, and I want to give you a couple, I'm going to give you two rival ways you can frame our results. And then from that, two different sort of mental models of how it comes about. So on the one hand, you can say you have more labor market power <laughs> Therefore, you uh, can offer lower wages. The other way of saying it is that employees get a benefit from working in one geography more than another. That create that is essentially a compensating wage differential for working there, a positive differential, which means you simply don't have to offer the same wages to compete in the broader national labor marketplace if you happen to be a place where people want to work, which I think we're all familiar with, that people in certain firms in different areas have the advantage of people want to work there, right? So they don't have to pay as much at the margin, which means this is just a compensating wage differential story. And you can argue it's not even truly monopsony. Uh, the, the point I would make is that the, the broader conversation right now and the reason we emphasize wage markdowns is we want to think about this as the gap between how much you're producing and how much you're getting paid. And is that wedge bigger or smaller? And whether or not you want to call that monopsony power or not is, is not just a semantic debate. Quite frankly, it's also a political debate and one that we are going to be gratefully kind of agnostic about. Um, now, where the how the power manifests at the bargaining level, I tend to think of it as firms are 
are driven by exit and filling openings uh, in their labor force. So it's more of a personnel thing of if more people are quitting or threatening to quit, I have to fill those slots or retain them. And in order to do so with any expediency or success, that, that force pushes up wages. And in areas where uh, employees want to stay there or want to work there, you don't have that same pressure, right, from workers. So it becomes, you can actually be quite passive as an employer, entirely passive even, and benefit from this local amenity, right? Because you just aren't pressured to raise wages the way your competitors in other labor markets might be, right? Because they're just at people who are constantly wanting to leave. So in that case, the it's 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 not somebody negotiating with a union and 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 it's certainly not someone trying to lower wages. It's the absence of upward pressure that I think is the most important thing. But to be clear, given our data constraints and our context. That's only marginally better than conjecture. I don't think we can really say what the the on the ground bargaining looks like. Um, and again, because there's there, there's no real collective bargaining happening here. So it's not like there's going to be a record of it. You would need, um, you know, honestly, a with firm history of how personnel bargaining takes place. And I'm I'm not aware of that. I mean, frankly, I'm not really aware of that existing anywhere ever, but I'm not the expert at, at that level of the labor market literature. Um, I don't know if that answers your question or not, Brian. Mm -hmm. uh, um, yeah, no, it's a good answer. I'll point out uh, in terms of a qualitative approach, you mm -hmm. could find some HR people who'd be willing to talk to you <laughs> that might give some insights. <laughs> I like the idea that you think HR people exist in Indonesia. But but when you talk about HR people in the U.S., we are starting a, a, a project to essentially do this same analysis in two dimensions in the U.S. One is going to be based on migration and politics, and the other is going to be based on criminal records. Um, that might, the criminal records side, because people do try to track qualitatively to create a sort of ethnography, if you will, of what it means to have the uh, criminal record stigma in the labor market and what it means when they go to job interviews and stuff. We might be able to do something like that to sort of add some flavor and a little color to this to this story in the US, but it's going to be it's already a vastly more complicated story. Uh and that's why we're going to we're, we're going to go after really narrow channels for migration and labor market power. Um in in Indonesia, I just don't think that data is even going to remotely exist. <laughs> Should we take, so Alphonse, I think, mm -hmm. you want to ask your question? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark, for an interesting paper. I hope my understanding of the economics will help me answer, question you in a good fashion here. Um, I, I see, I think I understand the concept of monopsy. Um, but I always have seen or understood uh, clubs, particularly local clubs, provide amenities, in other words, social capital. Mm -hmm. And um, it seems to me that there is some degree of harmony and cooperation that you would have these amenities. Now, I, 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 I you're indicating to us that the rents that the employer received would become the result of employees not don't have any mobility. Uh, but I'm looking at the maps that you gave in Indonesia, and I'm in comparison into the United States. It seems to me that we have a an island or a series of islands uh, in 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 an ocean where leaving that area would be very difficult in, in any way. While in the United States, for example, we have a lot of space. Mm -hmm. So uh, I wonder if you have any take on that. 
in terms of collective action. For example, uh, do they have any that they, do they have any organizations or labor organizations that will uh, fight for higher wages, as we may have in the United States, or labor unions and things of that nature? And I'm not sure if I'm going to I'm, I'm going outside your paper or not, but there those are questions that come across my my mind as I'm thinking about race relations and employee women involvement in and in, 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 in seeking equality and employment and things of that nature. I, I, am, I, am, I, am I going off base here some way or the other or in answering that question? Or, or do you understand what I'm saying? I, I don't think you're off base. Okay. I think those are all, I think, employer power and bargaining leverage are going to be relevant to any discussion of inequality, uh, any discussion, and you know, in Indonesia, you're going to think of it both very much in terms of racial and ethnic groups, right? You're going to, it's going to be relevant to um, basically the, the dynamics governing labor markets. Now, what you're not going to see is the same level of organized labor. You're not going to see these really large influential institutions that uh that are gonna sort of interact with this problem they just to my understanding there's nothing really comparable at, at, at scale in indonesia now the, the the thing about the archipelago that you referenced though that i think it really helps uh our context that that migration is never trivial in terms of cost relative to the median Indonesian worker, right? If you look at their household wealth and the cost of migrating to a completely different labor context, it's it's almost never going to be trivial, mm -hmm. right? But I and I, but I think what that does is it it that acts as a I don't want to say an accelerant as a complementary force that strengthens all of our results right now. And, and, and that's why you could make the argument that part of the reason we can empirically observe what we're observing is that everything's just a little stronger. Everything's just a little more salient. Moving your family is such a potentially catastrophic gamble, mm. quite frankly, that you have to get it right. And that means everything at the margin that holds you back, right? So if you are a minority religious household and you actually are part of a uh, coherent religious community, that's just one more reason that you're just not going to move no matter how bad your wages might be relative to your productivity. And I, I, I think, I think the, the physical structure, the geographic structure of Indonesia, and I was saying this earlier before we put the camera on, is, is so important to our results, but it's the hardest thing to convince economists uh, that is worth talking about because it's not something we're used to talking about, but also because it doesn't change. By, by, by definition, the islands are not moving in our 20 year window. Right. Um, now, we're obviously entering an era where that might not be the case anymore. They might be disappearing, but um, but that's neither here nor there. Um, now, in terms of measured inequality, this is something we've actually talked about internally. By, by internally, I mean my co-author and I, because we can show that these results increase inequality, right? But we are already picking at least three fights in this paper. And we are really loath to pick a fourth. <laughs> and so my suspicion is that if we get to write a follow-up paper on this, one of the dimensions will be how this change, it's gonna be two things. It's gonna be how it affects inequality and how it changes within household bargaining between specifically men and women, right? 
and and how that bargain changes when you have different possibilities for exit and and migrating to other markets, yada yada yada. Particularly when you have really different uh, education levels in the household. But I I just think that's paper number two, mm -hmm. um, because I mean we all know this at this point to, to be boringly pragmatic. When we submit this to journals and it gets refereed. What people are looking for is the veto and the thing that about your paper that they think is wrong. And I can only give them so many things that they think might be wrong. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's honestly the biggest reason why there's not a bigger discussion of it. Um, yeah. So Edu, do you want, so I have Edu and then Subi. Just a quick one for me. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Edu, yeah, of course, uh, sorry for arriving a few minutes late, I was finishing a meeting. Um, I really enjoyed the paper. I cannot, you know, unpack all the economics there, but I, I thought it was really provocative. And uh, I don't have a specific question on the paper, but I want to share my thought process uh, that it provoked, uh, particularly in terms of, you know, how do families uh, respond to that situation, right? What family strategies family can use? So I was thinking about my own uh, work in the Amazon um, with a different context, not labor market, right? But commodity market and then price markdowns because you depend on intermediaries. So it's a similar situation. And what we found over time is that, you know, instead of this decision of moving all together or staying all together in a place, mm -hmm. families organize themselves between different places. Mm -hmm. Right, so we, we call that um, multi-sided households. Some members of the family, you know, go uh, to seek better options, either better jobs or, you know, to position themselves in a market that, where they can sell things better in other member states. So, you know, they, the, the choice is not either or, but mm -hmm. one in which uh, they strategize to minimize these kinds of problems. So that it got me thinking about it. I thought it was really interesting. Uh, yeah. Anyhow, so no, no, no I, a specific question, but you know, no, thank you for sharing. The no point. idea how happy you're making because in the IFLS we can observe, and I never heard this term before, uh, multi-sided households. What we observe them as as households where uh, the head of the household is in a different kabupaten than the rest of the family, specifically where the children are. OK, so um, one of the things we were curious about is, do you have less leverage if the household is somewhere else? Right. Because by definition, this person isn't as connected to the community. Right. Now, the problem we have is we can't observe that in the census data. We can only observe it in the IFLS. And in the entire IFLS, I think we had 89 of these households, mm -hmm. which is. There's absolutely no chance for statistically measuring the impact when you have an N of 89, right? But if you have any thoughts on indicators at a higher level of the fraction of multi or how common multi-sided households are, I would love to look at that and to see if that weakens it. And the reason I had thought about it was because of these peri-urban communities in, in China where you have a lot of men who are essentially living in dorms, right? Working in manufacturing, their families are very far away and it very much changes the nature of local labor dynamics, right? Because they just have no connection there whatsoever other than employment. Um, you don't see the same phenomena at that scale in Indonesia, but it still very much exists, um, uh, particularly as, as, as households are transitioning from agriculture to manufacturing. So, if, and we can talk about this afterwards, but if, if you have any thoughts about measures or indicators of prevalence of, of this phenomenon, I think it's deeply relevant to what we do because I think it weakens that hold. And I think this is, it's, it's sort of counterintuitive, but I think these detached, well, mostly men, these detached men actually have more, not less bargaining power. That's my hypothesis, but we can't test it. Yeah. Yeah, we, we just sharing on that. The, yeah, it's great. We did, we collected a lot of data on this, but on household surveys. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's the, that that level of intensity of yeah. data collection. We found some data for Brazil, 
on what they call community movement. Mm. You know, so family members who go to study or to work somewhere and they have some official data on that. Um, yeah. Other than that, you have to collect the data yourself. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. The, the interesting thing that we found was that more women were leaving, you know, rural areas to have, you know, jobs or something in urban areas and returning. But there's mobility there. Is that, that correlating with education? Um, maybe it has to do with education, maybe because the economy is too gendered. Mm -hmm. right? So the opportunities are, are not there. You have that issue. Um, because I, I just, I know we had a grad student who did this fabulous dissertation a couple of years ago. And one of the phenomena she was really interested in was, um, how Indian households were solving the two body problem when the household was originally in a rural area. Uh, the work was in an urban area um, where you had these highly educated women that were often staying back in these rural areas where there's just no employment opportunity for their education. And that you have this sort of two body problem where it was a sense of like, well, someone has to, you know, oversee raising the family. And if they're going to work, they have to leverage the rest of the household, but the rest of the household isn't going to follow them to an urban area. So now all of a sudden you have these people who are, the only <laughs> the only family capital that will allow them to leverage their education is in a place where they can't leverage their education. And um, I, I, I see the, this commuting phenomenon, these two body problems, this uh, this this desperate need to to leverage household and family labor uh, and, and, and it. it changes the, the entire migratory dynamic of a country and but it's just one of those things where i see almost all of this happening in conversations around tables like this but i haven't yet seen the paper that goes we have the data where we can really see it you know even though we kind of know it's there and it's interesting so we want to yeah hi uh, professor makoski very nice uh, you picked up indonesia well, this uh, classic country, you know, mm -hmm. 231 million uh, Muslims, 87% of the population and 13% of the global Muslim population. Yeah. And uh, most, people, most people don't know that the second largest Muslim population in the world is in India. Mm -hmm. Oh. Uh, it's 200 million, and which is 14% uh, of our population. Mm -hmm. So so there's a larger Muslim population in India than Pakistan. Yeah. Because, See now that I did not know. So, so I'm I'm telling you this in the context of uh, a question that I'm trying to frame. Now, Indonesia has been very strong in terms of secularism and protecting the minorities, mm -hmm. and one of the best examples of that is here in this country. If you go to the Massachusetts Avenue in uh, Washington D.C., the Indonesian embassy and the Indian embassy are almost diagonally opposite to each other. Mm -hmm. In front of the Indian embassy, you will see the Mahatma Gandhi statue, mm -hmm. but in front of the Indonesian embassy, you will see the you will see the statue of Goddess Saraswati, which is the Hindu goddess of learning, and that statue is much larger than even the statue of Mahatma Gandhi on this side. Mm -hmm. Now, a country with uh, 87% Muslim population in U.S. having uh, such a statue of the goddess of learning of Hindu is a, one of the greatest examples of possibly, you know, how you have secularism in practice. However, having said so, in Bali where you showed, you know, and Bali has still a lot of the concentration of the ancient Hindu kings and the culture, and till date, you know, that is religiously followed. In fact, they have their own uh, Ramayana scripture and everything different from what uh, actually was there in India. No? So my question is, so there was once an attempt uh, to do some terrorist activities in mm -hmm. Bali when there was the bomb bombing and everything you have seen. Mm -hmm. So the financial crisis had impacted as you saw this. God forbid a communal crisis happens. Where do you see is the impact on the whole uh, monopsy or the you know structure in the whole society does it impact the economy or or if, if a what crisis happened if, if a communal crisis happens where the minorities 
get threatened or trouble. Oh. Wow. Well, so it's always interesting when I'm asked to speculate on something both that important and that terrible. Um, but it, it's worth thinking through. So let's think about it from the ground up. If there's a situation where these tightly knit pockets of religious minorities feel less physically secure and probably less economically secure, their employment feels less concerned, yeah. their political rights feel less yeah. secure, there's two directions they can go. You can either imagine the gravity of each one of these pockets becomes stronger, right? And what it, so you have minority groups spread across the country, mm -hmm. and then they pull into, so all of the Hindus, the 22% uh, the, the who don't live in Bali, mm -hmm. they move to Bali, right? Mm -hmm. um, you have the Catholics that are not in the Catholic province, they go to the Catholic yeah. province. Same thing with Protestants, mm -hmm. same thing with everyone. So you could imagine you would have this tightening, and the, the um, in that case, there's nowhere else you want to be now. So what that would do is actually make, it would mean the premium, the wage premium you would pay for the privilege of working in the one place in the country you feel safe could, could go up, right? The other direction it could go, though, is an exodus from Indonesia, right? Now, that's a lot harder, but if we're talking about a truly catastrophic event, you know, which hopefully doesn't happen, then all of these local communities become thinner. And now at the margin, those communities actually offer less. So that would mean the monopsony, the weight premium would actually go down. So if it's in within country concentration effect that happens, monopsony power goes up, wage, wages go down. Mm -hmm. And if it's an exodus from the country, monopsony power goes down, wages go up. Relative now, of course, if we're talking about that level of catastrophic event, we now have to consider the possibility that there is now an increase in the bias, right, in discrimination. That effect could swamp everything, right? So, but if we're truly talking about some sort of political crisis that isn't accompanied with a broad social shift, then yeah, that's what. Unfortunately, we're running out of time. So, okay. do you have a Quick question. There is a quick question there. You, Diana, you too? Later. I would say just go for all the questions and then you have one minute to reply and then no. wrap up. <laughs> yeah, I have nowhere to go. Yeah, you can just hang out here all day. Yeah, we are going to have lunch here yeah. so people stay so we can have yeah. the conversation. So do you, do you want to shoot your I think just one quick link is that yeah, really yeah. interesting yeah. is last, like, yeah. was it last week? We had um, a really interesting presentation about some work being done on the Amish population, mm -hmm. Deanna, and how they've changed locales, basically just based on the price of agricultural land, right? So it's it it less of a wage disparity than just, hey, this is, yeah. This is more affordable. This is going to be better for our family. And usually one, you know, family goes and then the rest of the community can follow. So I'm, I don't know. I, I, I could totally understand the, the focus here on the wage differential, but I wonder about the, the, the price of land as also being an interesting variable here. Yeah. And that's actually one of the reasons why, um, well, the number one reason we don't focus on agriculture is we have no ability to measure the marginal product of labor and how it's changing agriculturally because there's a technological component to that too that's really important. Yeah. Um, the uh, and so manufacturing doesn't have the same mobility, yeah. right? And that's part of what like firms don't really have the luxury in manufacturing firms don't have the luxury of just pulling up shop and saying we'll go to where all the Buddhists are because we can get them cheaper. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's why you don't see these effects getting moderated in within our 20 year window. Yeah. Now, over the next 50 years, if this effect is sufficiently strong that it gives you a market advantage, it could be eroded by migration. And, and a little bit of the way you're talking about with agriculture. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, but I think within our window, yeah. that's just not uh, viable. Yeah. 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 And Brian had some links to Indonesian HR professionals for what it's worth. <laughs> um, but yeah, maybe a closing thought and then we can continue conversations over lunch if that's okay. Yeah. 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 So any concluding remarks? No, I really just appreciate everybody engaging with the paper. Uh, it's um, it, it is an unusual paper and uh, it's not, 
it's not always a thing where everywhere I take it, everyone takes it with, uh, with the same seriousness that everyone in this room did. So that's just my thank you. That's true. That's great. Well, yeah. thanks. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. I think we have we have lunch we as have always. Lunch. And I don't know if you have any announcements or yeah. what we do.